We're going to learn how to plan better. We're going to learn how to use means today. There are no wrong answers. We're just warming up here. But what's the difference between a means and an end? The end is a result. The means is how you get there. And what your grandmother or your aunt or your uncle used to say? The ends don't justify the means. That's, that was the first thing somebody said this week at Wednesday morning group. And we get that back. And we said it backwards in two other groups. Like the means don't justify. The, you know, it's like we, we get it confused all the time. And that is all day long. We're going to see. We get, mean, we get means and ends confused. So let's give some example of what, things that are means and some things that are ends. Good war theory. Sun Tzu would agree with you. Uh, so would a whole lot of other people. General Patton. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. 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 Like we, and, and I mean, thousands of ends actually lose their life because people are ends. You're an end. You're, you're, you're made by God to be, glory, to be in glory forever. But we sometimes put ends toward use, toward doing it. Better make sure that's something important, huh? Yeah. What else? An example. Graduating from high school or college. Is what? Would be the end. Yeah. And? The end, of, end it's over when they do that? You get a piece of paper. There, there, is a, there is a recognition of an enormous milestone. We're not limiting it, right? All of you, some of you have been through four graduations. Kindergarten, grade school, high school, college, graduate school. Uh, but, it's, but it kind of it's a new beginning too, isn't it? So it's a, that's kind of a temporary end that leads, to, that leads to, to more. Okay. What is your most important end? Eternal life. Robert? Salvation. Salvation. Oh, yeah. Good. 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 Presbyterian. Love God. Enjoy Him forever. That's right. That's right. How should I be now? Well, I'm his, how I'm going to be. I'm going to be in perfect rest. I'm going to be I'm gonna love and enjoy Him forever. Good. What means do you use most often? Time. Energy. Yeah, the energy you've been given is a means, too. Good. Time. Time, energy, money. Yeah. Money. It's neutral. These things are neutral. Today's time is neutral. Uh, technology, neutral. Who's seen technology used for bad? Just me. Good. Well, y'all are using it all for good. I'm glad. Technology can be used for good. Social media can be used for good. Social media can be used for bad. Money is a neutral means. It's neutral. Completely. Okay. What means have done more for your life, money, or the sacrifice of others? And we give two or three to give an example of that. So say this and say, here's how it happened for me. Who's been impacted more by money or by personal sacrifice? Yeah, people have said all week long, I had no idea the sacrifice my parents went through until I raised these kids. Yeah. So you get how many guys don't have kids yet? Looks like about half this group doesn't have them at least. And that, that's good. But, but you'll never know what, what your parents went through. And somebody else said early in the week that it was, you know, that his dad you know, really didn't, it didn't, it didn't you know, treat him that great. But there was, some, there was a coach along the way who just said, I'm going to love that kid. I'm going to go. I am just going to love that kid. I'm going to spend time with that kid. And I'm going to be empathetic. And I'm going to come after, I'm going to come after him and change him forever. And that, that, that person now does the same in a crazy way. So yes, the sacrifice is not close. Not close. Perfect. That's a, that's a free biscuit and a free coffee. Wait, for sure. What lies, this is live no lies, what lies do you tend to believe about means? All I need is a few more nickels. The money will get you everywhere. Who else has believed that lie before? I got this, got these things, got these things. If I just can organize them in this fashion, boom, it'll happen. All right. Is work an end or a means? Work is a means. A means toward what? People. Or people. You've been coming. That's a free biscuit. That's right. That's right. So, so yeah, so yeah. It's a means. We think that our career, even, our, your career is a means. We're, we're going we're to prove all that today. What lie do we believe about ends? That, that, and that's an end because they're stuck there. We can't, that person won't go past that end. 
A person can't change. We saw that in the one we, where we dug into people and how to, with coworkers, right? They just, eh, they'll always be the same. What else? What about the end? Do might we be tempted to, if I just get this job, it'll all be better. And by the way, the whole world, Gallup did a poll, and this is now 15 years old or so, but like people used to say that things they wanted in life were food, shelter, clothing, kind of Maslow's needs, and now it's all wrapped up in one term. I've, all I want for myself and my family and the, the one I love or, is a good job. Because, it, because it's now synonymous with providing those other things, but it's not the end. It's not the end. We'll see. We'll see how. This can be a cycle of means, yes? Achieve. Who, li who lives more in a monthly cycle at work? Your targets. Monthly? Who lives more in a quarterly cycle? Who lives more in a yearly cycle? Your business cycle. Really, it's easy. In the French, they say live on like five-year cycles. That seems more, a little more freeing. It's time to make it up. Uh, but, you know, there's long, they have a longer view of strategic planning. They have a longer, not such an urgency. And you know, they have wine at lunch and naps at one. So, and that's, you know, it, it all allows that. But how does, how does it feel when you finish that great month or quarter, whichever one? It feels temporary. You congratulate yourself. You celebrate it. Hey, I got, we, got, we got delinquency to here and we got revenue to here. All right. All right. He said temporary. Hang on just a second. What happens? Back to zero. And especially, especially if you hit a record. Who's hit a record? And they're like, man, now we're great. So, and now, now we got to do that again. I literally had that as a loan officer training in Nashville some 30 something years ago. My manager said to me, I said, I mean, I'm a, I think I'll do eight or nine loans this month or whatever. He goes, oh, don't do that. Don't do that. They're going to think down headquarters. We can all do that. And we collected at the end of the month. So like, let's just, let's just collect. You know, don't, don't be going crazy. We'll, we'll raise the standard. Um, and I wrote about that in the article. Like, we're going to get to, get to two billion. That's going to make everything great. That's, that's just what Wall Street said was capacity and all that. Let's get there on our run rate. And then, no, just it's a cycle. And then all the financial structures and everything we had to do debt-wise, leverage-wise, securitization-wise, all fancy financial terms and that, would, that really were supporting more production. Let's just keep going. Let's keep going. Just, just like that to get more. It doesn't stop. So that's a means to a means to a means to a means. See how it goes? We think it's an end. That $2 billion goal, that sounds better than high school. Yeah. It's a means to a means to a means. And even I'm in graduate school. It's a means. Am I doing it to get to what? To get to what? So we're going we're to see all that in just a second. All right. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Okay. Again, we're in live no lies. That's where we are right now. We're getting to freedom right after this. But, you know, we pick on money. We pick on money. But, I mean... Money is kind of the chief means. It is, as we've seen before in other lessons, there's a great article on this if you need it. It's a great video on this if you need it and just have you text me or your friend text me. It is fungible. We can turn it more than anything. When Jesus said this, it's fungible. It can be turned into lots of stuff. It can be turned into something else. It helps us get things. It is accountable. We can count it. We like to count stuff. And I start looking at a golf tournament on a Friday afternoon, especially a big one. I can't. I've got to keep going back, see what the numbers are. We like, we kind of can get addicted to numbers. Well, money's even easier to do that with. It's accountable and it's storable. I can, I can have some now. I can save it for later. I got to decide. Put some away. The, the financial strategy is what, you know, Mike believes this. The third spend, a third save, a third give away, right? So, but I have, it's, it's, I can decide what to do with it. So, what does it mean you can't serve two masters. How is God your master? Let's give a, a positive example. What does it mean that you're serving God as a master? Yeah. So you went, you, you're answering both parts. That's good. But yeah, God is like, your God, well, uh, the basic of God, your God I'm not. That's a good one. That's, we'll start right there. I believe in you. I know you got me. Help me believe. That's, that's maybe the second most basic prayer. And then we see your kingdom come. Your will be done. Not mine. You know, we see these, yours, or the, your God, I'm not. 
Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Those are basic things. And Lord, what would you have me do? I'll do it. We're going to get to that in a minute. Because some of that gets down to, the, who's asked that question? Some, Lord, what would you have me do in this situation? See, So, now what does it mean to serve money? How is that synonymous? And I, and I thought, who's, I need it, I need it, I need it. And he says, oh, that's a great song. Lord, I need you every hour. I need you, I need you, I need you. And that's a great testimony that, that, that says you know you're His when you say, Abba, Father, I don't have this. I, I need something. I need you, Lord. And so when we do this, I need, I need money, I need money. I need it, I need it, I need it. If I just had this, I'm going to be good. If I just, and then when we do that, when we put the $2 billion target or a 30% increase, most of us are living in like, Lord, about 30% more would make all this work. Think about that truth for a second. Yeah, about everything, we, we can just see about 30% more pretty easily. It kind of just smooth everything out. Think about your own budget, right? Because right? we can just go a little further. Um, some don't. Some, some really have means problems, okay? And, we, and we're out here to help solve that. And some really have uh, no means problems. But everybody in between is kind of like, eh, about 30% kind of get this going. Yeah, and it'll pop back up today or tomorrow, right? It's, who, who's going to have it? Who's going to have it pop back up? <laughs> okay, we are. Okay, so we, this is a, this is a, first start is to know you have the problem. The second to, is to move forward. And that's what Piper says when we think about how we position ourselves underneath money. If, you know, like if I can put myself in this position or if I had a, a million nickels dropped on me, we call it nickels here, it kind of helps make it easier, uh, make it less, gives it less importance, makes it less of a God. Nickels. So we put our, but if I had a million more nickels, if somebody dropped it on tomorrow, you would rearrange these things, right? You'd, you'd rearrange some things and that'd be okay. But that's what he says and that's what we looked at a couple of weeks ago. It's like, think about now, no, that's how I'm supposed to think about God. I'm underneath him. How do I arrange things underneath him? Okay? Here's how lies work. We won't spend a lot of time on this because we're a little behind. But like, deceptive ideas. The very first one was, did God really say? And that's the thing we ask ourselves. Did God really say? That's what the serpent said to Eve. Did God really say? You can't eat from that tree. He said we can't eat from We can't even touch it. Oh, that's what we do. We make it just a little more unreasonable. God didn't say don't touch it. I guess, he said, I guess you could touch it all the time. So, but we add a little more unreasonableness to it. So it's a truth. It's, the worst lies are this. They're a truth that just get twisted at the end. Now the worst one would be 99.9.9%. They're not two decimals in any number. They're, but it'd, be all, it'd almost be all the way true with a twist. It's a deceptive eye. And then, and then our flesh kind of goes, I like that. I mean, God could be holding out on us. I mean, like, we have everything. It's perfect. He's providing everything. There's no reason to fear. We hadn't sinned yet. They don't, think, they don't know what sin is. But if there's a little more, I'll take it. That's what she did. That's what she did. Eve didn't have this, but the rest of us do. Adam did. Everybody else is doing it. The pattern is there. Everybody else is doing it. Everybody else is going for money. Everybody else says that's what it's about. Everybody else has this. Everybody else has a seven boat lake house. I'm just trying to get a, a notch above what I think anybody has. Because you can have seven boats and use them well. Okay, so it's not, it's never the thing. It, it is really the heart. God wants your heart. And you know if you're going, to, you're changing your heart toward a, a desire. It's not. You're within you. The truth of God's words written on every person's heart. And you know if you kind of twist like, am I, why am I doing that? Am I, why am I doing that? Okay. Those are a lot. That's how it works. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. You're mine. That's God's answer. Do not fear. Do not worry about this. You are mine. Whew. That's good news. Hit a mic. It's really good news. I really wanted to put an exclamation mark on this. because you see that some places, you are mine. You hear... I couldn't mess with the text. I just couldn't do it. So, but it really is. He says it that way all the time to you. I got you. You're mine. I got you, you're mine. Rely on that. How about this one? As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. A lot. Perfectly. Perfectly, the Father loves the Son. The Son is perfect. Well, it's helpful. But what he said, he goes, you knuckleheads aren't perfect. Not for a day. He, this is in the upper room. This is at the, the Last Supper. This is right before they walk out. 
Or maybe they walked out already. That's not the point. The point is he's got the disciples together. He's given them this word. He's given it to us. He later says, this is for everybody. I love you perfectly. He told them this. They didn't, they didn't last two hours. And they fell asleep. He loves them perfectly. As the Father loves the Son, He loves them perfectly. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, that's the next verse, you'll remain in my love. So somehow, the commandments aren't this performance thing. The commandments are this means to stay in love. You already love perfectly. But how do I know it? When I do it, when I kind of live the life He's called me to live. That's how I know it. I get reaffirmed. I guess something pretty tough comes up. I do it His way instead of mine. Whew. Well, that was good. Counting on God is good. God did that, not me. That's good stuff. Now I'm kind of reaffirmed. Reaffirmed. Oh, He loves me. He loves me. Well, that was a mess. That was difficult. That was painful. Again, we can prove that in a minute. But certainly, even when people are doing terrible stuff to me, I remain in His love. So, what about this? Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Okay, so, high school's a good finish goal. Graduate school's a good finish goal. The, the corporate goal is probably a good, most of those goals are probably good. But set it and purpose it on the things above. That's what he's saying. Set it, I've got you, I've got you, I've got you, I love you perfectly. Set it and align it on the things above. Set your mind on these earthly things. Listen to Paul David Tripp. This has been rocking me for a couple of weeks. You have only two choices on earth. A way of thinking that is all about right here, right now, physical moment. Who, who, who tempted? Everybody? Or an above way of thinking that looks at life from the vantage point of a grand redemptive story, and more specifically from the perspective of the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's your choice? Is it material reality? Is it the only reality? Is it just about today? Is it just about this nickel? Is it just about getting this house right? Is it just about getting this business right? Is it just about this one more nickel? Or viewed through the lens of the radical truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is it for you? Where the rubber meets the road in your daily life. What is it? Every moment is this choice. Toward him, toward not. And this, here's why this rocked me. First, like, sometimes I just think there's a minute for some time off. Whew, can I just, I had a pretty good week. Lord, I've done some of what you've asked me. Can I just relax? What he's saying is he is the relaxation. Our schools teach us this. Five days of hard work, relax for, for Friday night and Saturday. Then go to church Sunday and do the other. Our businesses teach that. Work hard, play hard, all that. But, and I'm not, sure, I'm not sure, work hard, play hard, and there's no one more in there. What's the other one? Do I know the rest of that one? But there's, there's a third one there, I think. Isn't there, Henry? Rest okay. hard. Rest hard. Well, good. Let's say that. <laughs> but in him, I can still do all, I can still do all of that. Rest, rest away from God is not rest. So every, that's where it was rocking with me. It may be rocking you a different way. But every moment of business, a choice. Every moment of family, a choice. Every moment, even how to rest, His. And so part of it might be like, how do I rest? I walk around the green line, just stare at trees. I don't have to infuse three chapters of the Bible to do that. I can just stare at trees and, and count His goodness. I can go sit in the deer stand. I know I'm His when I do that. Where am I really resting in Him? And where am I doing something else that's separate? Everything's a choice. Every, and the, then you bring, it, bring that back to work. Because the habits of your life are more important than your work. But then, where am I saying, oh, I did all this for Him. I did these three things for Him yesterday. Can't this just be about the business? No, every moment. His. Every single one. And we've been covering this diagram. But who says, well, Tom already said it. Per, the point of life is, is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Who has trouble making that tangible? And when, and when you have a big decision, you have a big decision, you kind of look, you know, re-look at this, but this is, this is how it works. And some of you can be gift-focused, like, I've got this, how do I use it? And, and, a, and, a, and we tease all the time, a 12-year-old soccer player knows he's supposed to glorify God. He's memorized that in catechism in some, in, in some Presbyterian school. And then he says he knows that. I want to play soccer. I'm going to use it to glorify God. But he's really, he's backed into that, right? And we can be that way. But we have this gift. I'm good at it. 
is toward the needs of the world. That's how we know it's toward the, that, that verse that all the law boiled down to one word, love your neighbor. So boil down to that. Push toward him. So if I have a gift, it's a gift confirmed by loving my neighbor. If I have means, a co this is for corporations, but the person went in very different. What the mission opportunity is to push gifts that, that we have with the organization. We got a team that works gr great together. We've got these assets. We've got these means. We've got these means of financing. We've got these means of time. We've got these people. We've got all this stuff together. Let's put it toward the needs of the world. And we do that for all stakeholders. Let me come to you and say, well, I'm doing this. Well, the Wall Street says. Now, we've taken some money from Wall Street. So we owe them back, you know, because we, we entered into a term on that and we owe, we owe that back. But so we've got it. We've, we're pretty good at honoring. That means look at an annual report. How much does an annual report say? Here's the good of the world we're doing. And here's the nickels. Most of it's about nickels for a public company, but even for a private company. They're easier to count. They're easier to say. But the mission of those companies, we looked at them. Facebook's to bring the world together. Give or take a word. Cokes, to refresh the world. Starbucks, to bring community together one cup at a time. Nike, was to crush Adidas. Now it's to inspire athletes around the world or something like that. So that, those, those are statements of love. You can see how that could be love. But then how are you doing? If, if, if it all becomes about the nickels, then you can't do it. And so one of those companies, without judgment, that's their mission but there was a whistleblower to Congress that said, I've got all this data. I can see we're tearing the world apart. I can prove in the data we're tearing the world apart. We're not doing our mission. And so she used that and she went to Congress and, whistled, and said, this data is tearing the world apart. And that changed, that changed the way that organization is doing some things. So that the missions are good to declare. The mission's right. Mission's only been around in companies about, about 50 years now. The church had them first. Jesus gave us one called the Great Commission. Great Command. And then they had them in battle, like Tom's talking about. Here's the mission. And then companies picked them up with, with uh, Peter Drucker about, uh, about 50 years ago. So all toward one thing. And this, how can you do that? How can you love? How can your gifts be used to serve the needs of the world? Just take it one more past, past the word of luck. What do people need? To know that they are image bearers. Yeah. To know they're image bearers. It's a, it's a real religious way to say it. A real, and I'm not even religious, it's just a scriptural way to say it. It's what God says. It's good. Now, how does that, what does that, what does that mean at the workplace today? If they're image bearers, they have what? Value, value. They have value. Okay. I'm not sure that's not the number one thing you can do to each time with each person is you have value. You matter. We proved that in the working one. It's what employees want at major companies around the world. And it's been true for more than 30 years for sure is that I want to know, think about yourself, like, I want to know that what I bring to bear, what the gifts and strengths that I have are used and make a difference at this organization. And if, and if, the, if the boss is good at that, think about the best boss you've had, he's good at saying, you're good at this. Let's push it this way. That feels good, doesn't it? I was just used to matter to the organization today. So everybody can do that. Everybody can leave a conversation with a mad customer, making them feel more valued. You're too good for this. Even in collections, you can do that, can't you, Wade? Like, because you're too good for this. This isn't good for you. You matter. You make a difference. You need to pay the nickels. That's a bad, it's a bad pattern you're going under. You can, you can start, they have value, they make a difference. You can do that for people all the time. How else can you do it? Who believes the thing you're selling people actually need? I think so. You're straightening out whole systems of, of, of systems for government. I think you're right. I think that needs, things need to be better organized. Things are a mess. What, some of your financial planners, what a financial plan provide somebody? Clarity, which leads to hope. Even if it, even if it's less than you thought, it leads to peace of mind. I got this. Is what it is where I am. Leaders define reality and offer hope. Okay, so here's reality. 
Here's hope. Am I providing peace of mind? Am I enhancing their needs? Jesus meets presenting needs first. Huh, your leg's not working. Let's get that fixed up. Now you trust me. So somebody's not going to, can't go around throwing verses everywhere. If, if, you're not, if you're not saying you that are valuable, you matter. Let me, let me, I'm going to do this in a way that gives you peace. I'm going to do this in a way that gives you happiness. I'm going to do this. You need this thing. Believe in your business. And if it's, if it's true, if you see it hurting people, stop believing in it. Leave. If it hurts people more than it helps them. Now, everybody's will hurt more than help. Paul made tents. Some people think really big, massive ones in a whole industry. Either way, people send in those tents. <laughs> and either way, now, uh, and so like he didn't say you can only use this for good. He just made tents because they needed them. I'm, over, I'm greatly oversimplifying. We can talk about that later in depth. But so that's true. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out. Or you'll be destroyed by each other. So was, is business more like bite and devour right now? Or is it more like love? Who gets bitten and devoured even with internally? Somebody's after you. Happens, right? It will happen. Some organizations are better at it than others. Some are in goal. Simon Sinek says that, that even industries within insurance or within, within cheer, within anything, let's say let's all work together to one end. It's a, he calls it the infinite game. He's almost, he's almost there. We're going to show he's, how close he gets. We can all work together and get better, serve people better. That's what he's saying. But look at this. So all of this is how do we know it's right? Is it love? That's where we started. That's our verse. The will of God and loving others. And so if you're charged with pulling something together corporately, if you're thinking about starting something new, this is how it works. I'm going to use every means and every gift toward the needs of others, and that's what glorifying God is. Every time. And we know it's synonymous because Jesus gives us this little clue. He gives, actually gives us about a million clues in, 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 in just about. But one huge one, when he said, Lord, to totally human, totally God, Lord, is there another way? As they walk out there, right after he said these verses, some of these we're covering, Lord, is there another way? But not my will, but thy will be done. So in the biggest moment, the thing that allowed you access to God, the biggest moment in love in the history of the world, he said, is there another way? No, there's only one way, this perfection they ordained from the beginning of the time. That's why you got to read in your Bible through a year Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and all the law and understand it to realize they tried everything. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees were adding extra stuff to it. And it wasn't working. I get holier and holier and holier. No, no, that, you stopped loving a long time ago when you started adding all that stuff to it. What it all is, so the only one way to pay for everything was to lay down his life. So the, the and, and John 15, 13 says, no greater love than this than a man lay down his life for his friends. A woman lay down his life for his friends. That's, that's love. And so I'm pushing the, the best thing that's ever been done for you. Your parents did it. Your coworkers have done it. Your, a good boss has done it. Uh, you have friends that have done it. They've sacrificed for you to push it forward. And that's, that's what an organization should be about. To push, use gifts in a way that might even cost something to means. All the way. Uh, we, we compared means. Means are this way. Here's how you know it's a means. If I get 18 high school diploma, is it better? No? Yes or no? If I get what? Get 18 high school diplomas, is it better? No. No. One will do. Don't need more. Do I need more blood than I have? Some people do. <laughs> and do I need more oxygen? Means. Do I need more water? In Germantown? Yes. So do I need, do I need, if it's bad, I need it. I need it to be a certain level. But at a level, this is what money is, guys. To a certain level, it's right. It keeps everything going. But to another level, it's useless. Like 18 high school graduations. Oh, it must be a means. Could I use more, could I use more sacrifice of others? For myself, I could, actually. Could I use more? But you could, too. But actually, it's finished. It's complete. God did it. So now, I can go sacrifice for others. See, how that, that's how you test it. If I have too much of this, is it good or bad? It became non-neutral when I got too much of it. 
blood becomes non-neutral, oxygen. And by the way, Jim Collins, one of the greatest business thinkers of our time and built to last, he's the one who said this. So it's, the, the fact that layoffs, and Simon Sinek goes over this, layoffs were kind of a new thing also in the 70s and 80s because they they'd made certain promises of certain margins instead of staying together. Now look, a business, the good of the business does run out. The, the raw materials run out. So there are times you have to, to right-size business. I'm not, I'm not saying that's wrong. It's not. But what's the greatest means of love? Just holding this thing together and all failing at once isn't love. So you have to say, what's love? What's love for the stakeholders? Well, we promise this. What's love for the customers? Let's do this. What's love for the people that work here? Okay. How do we make this practical in 13 minutes? Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and He will establish your plans. Pray first, for sure. But pray, and prayer is preparation for action. So I'm not going to pray one way and then act another. I'm going to do everything in the name of Jesus is, is a verse in Colossians. Okay? How about this one? The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. Who's done something really fast and say, uh-oh, uh-oh. Hits in too fast on that email. <laughs> I'd like to have that one back. So diligent, thinking it through, diligence. So it seems like if we were strategic, it's that way. Now how about this one? The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Wait a minute. If I'm diligent, it works out fine. Isn't that what we just said? There's a paradox here. I'm diligent. Works out fine. I get up and pray. But who's, who's, who's done some diligence and it, it turned out bad? Every decision is from the Lord. He, every result. Listen to what Tim Keller says on this. Your plans belong to you. Your choices belong to you. But what actually happened is completely set. It's completely fixed. Both at the same time, not 50-50, not like 50% free, I have 50% free will, and then he's got it 50% fixed. No, I have 100% free will, and it's 100% the fix is in. 100% determined under the sovereignty of God. Now, who does that, does that stress you partly out, or does that free you? Go be, get up and pray, Frank. Be diligent. Do it as Jesus would do it. Fix is in. Is that freeing or stifling? It's free. Free. Somebody said earlier this week, we pray for, for a sick person we can't help. We're praying, Lord, you've got to pray, pray, pray. So even my best efforts on the soccer field, of best efforts in the deer stand, best efforts in guiding this team, best efforts, it's my faithfulness that matches with his righteousness. Let's go all the way through this. People are always saying, I need God's guidance. I need God's guidance. I got to figure out his will. But God's guidance, according to the Bible, is something God does more than he gives. Lord, just give me an answer. Who said that? Somebody right here earlier this week really freaked out. I've saying that all the time. I'm praying to do his will. Keep doing it. He's not saying don't do that. This is one of the things. It's not both and. It's, it is, it's all together. Lord, show me. Lord, what is love in this situation? I have no idea. I've never seen this situation before. But help me see what love is. But yet, Lord, you've got it. You've got it. And it's something he does. He's done. You've learned more about him through stuff. Ronnie Stevens says, the Bible is not just a rule book put down on you, but your life is given to you to understand the Word of God. The situation, that's how He guides you, through the situation itself. Oh, I made some bad decisions in that. And so, you know, when somebody says, I need God's guidance, I need God's guidance, you're standing in it. You're His, you're mine, you're loved like, you've, like Jesus is loved by the Father. You're standing in the middle of God's guidance right now. Who's got something that's sort of tough in your life right now? You don't have to raise your hand. Because we all do. It's either a little tough. It's not compared to the big tough thing. We're standing in the middle of His guidance. Right now when you're hearing His Word, He's with us. And, it, and as you go through it today and tomorrow and a month. So how do we make it super practical? Look, he, Joseph is the example of this, right? So think about it. He was supposed to go down to check on the brothers. He did. He got thrown in a ditch. What am I supposed to do with this, Lord? They might kill me. You're standing in His guidance. He did exactly what he was supposed to do in Potiphar's house when, when he was chased around. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. He got thrown in prison for it. He's standing in the middle of God's guidance. God used that. He didn't say, Lord, what are you doing here? You guarantee you he prayed that. He knew he was God's. 
He had dreams. You know, I don't think he gave up on it. Maybe he gave up on his dreams for three days, six days, 12 days, 30 days. I don't know. I can't wait to find out. We're going to find out. Oh, you did that too, God. That's how you did it. And then Joseph said, you know, I'm just going to love people and telling people, oh, he, tr he so turned his action into love, they told him everything. Here's how it works. In eight minutes, gifts and means. So remember, we, we define gifts or things about you, things you have. I mean, I said this well, but gifts you deploy. They're yours, they're given to you, and you deploy for the needs of others. Means you utilize. See, there's a, there's a, the difference in those two words, utilize is and take it and put it towards something. It's inanimate. I'm going to utilize it. Rock, I'm going to quarry. You know, I'm going to get all I can. If I'm, I'm going to get all I can from the field, get up, harvest all the corn, unless I'm supposed to leave some for others. I'm going to do it all. But that's, that, that, those are means. The gift I'm, is mine. It's given to me. I'm deploying it. I'm developing it. I'm making it better by using it. I get better at it. So you see the difference in means and gifts? There's some, I say the gift is something you have that's been given to you. Okay? And then you put that toward a temporary goal. Let's call high school a temporary goal. We keep, we keep using that example. Let's use it. High school is a temporary goal. It is a means. Towards, it's, a, it's a slightly ends and is a means toward a missional goal. Like what am I really here for? What's the company? What's the, the mission of this organization? Am I meeting it to the eternal purpose? Which is... That's where we started. To glorify God and join forever. So a goal that serves a means, a more important goal is best practice. They're smart. Right? They're specific, measurable, attainable, or realistic, realistic time-based. So I've got it. I can, that, that's good. I need to graduate high school by this day. High school, they don't let you stay two or three years like they do in college. Not too often. I guess they do sometimes. But, but I gotta get, I'm going to get it done by this date. That's okay. I'm going to do it that way. But same with the corporate objective. Same with this project. Has this, right? A good project? Has this every time. I've got to get it done by this time. It's, it's toward the mission. And if it gets off of the mission, it's no good. If it's not helping the company, it's no good. Oh, we, we, we plan this thing to such a place. It's no longer supporting the mission. It's become, it's become an ends in itself, and it's not toward the mission we got to abandon. Who's abandoned a project before? That's how you know it's not consistent with the means. Bob Goss says he quits something every Thursday. I like that. <laughs> really good for us ADD guys. I don't have to do that anymore. So, like, I think that's good. Like, is this, is this helping me reach the mission? I can throw some of that away. Is it my goal? The mission is an organizational goal that serves the needs of the people. The message of which the goal is pursued helps all stakeholders flourish. Everyone. I know it's missional if it's helping everybody. A family has a mission. You may have a personal mission statement. But the organization, the way I know it is, is it happening? Is, or is everybody in the deal flourishing? Are we helping others flourish? And the eternal purpose is pursuing eternal purpose now leads to knowing and sharing Jesus in this life and glorifying and joining forever. Here's how you know if you're working toward the ends. Do I know him better now? Was it a bad day? But do I know him better now? Was it a good day? Do I know him better now? It, it, did that goal help me know him better? Even that one way back, him using, utilizing a gift he gave you helps you know him better. Because you might say, thank you, Lord. Or you might use it so much you get to the end of it and you go, Lord, help me. Deploying the means He's given you, everything is from Him. Deploying the nickels toward the needs of others. You know Him better. Same with missional goals. Is it aligning? Has it helped me know Him better? The Christian, Kim Wilson came and said, it's the Christian who lives in this, who, when they're not doing it, is, is it the most pain? I don't know, God. I, I don't know any difference. I'm just moving toward. Some of those goals we mentioned that sound like they're saving the world are not necessarily redemptive. It's just, it's just a good thing to say. And they're using biblical language to do it. That should tell you something. They're starting to borrow from the Bible to create the best possible mission statements. But they don't know what that means exactly, so they can't stay on it. If you know what it means, that's why we have these sessions. That's why we're going to start back the week after Labor Day. And so, because we've we got to get deeper and deeper and deeper into practicality to know what this means towards your eternal purpose. Here's how we can know. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Where are we on verses? Brad, where are you? Mike, where are you? Uh, for from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Okay. 
That's the, one of the proof texts for the first thing Brad said. That's what we're here for. And we use this verse a lot because it's really clarifying. How does this clarify for you? Who's got a tough client in front of him, him today? He got a meeting like, I really am not too fired up about this meeting. Who's got one? Anybody? Yeah. Where'd you get this? What do you mean? Like, the meeting. Where'd it come from? Uh, referral. Referral. Then, where'd that come from? Where'd that come from? Where'd that person come from? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> probably, probably either a phone call or a referral. Okay, yeah, 16 steps, can't remember. And then where'd that come from? Or don't know? From God. It came from God. If the result is in, the fix is in, this thing that's ahead of me today, the thing I'm excited about, the thing I'm not excited about, it's from God. It's from Him. If you're in the middle of it, remember, His will is where you're at. That's good English. His will is where you're at. As Sue Campbell told Ken and Vaughn, either he is or he ain't. Either he's sovereign over every minute or he's not. It woke Ken, it's just the truth Ken and need to hear in this most desperate moment. Either he is or he ain't. It's either from him or it's not. Okay, then how are you going to get this thing done, this difficult thing today? Uh, tr trust God. Trust him. Trust him and do it his way. If I do it some way that's not his. So this person may be a total stinker. Some of us have had bad bosses. Love them. What's love for this guy? This gal. Can gals be bad bosses too? Sometimes. Mostly guys. Right? Can they be? So love him. What's love? I may have to tell him something strong. When Jesus, when Jesus told the rich young ruler to go sell everything, that was the most loving possible thing he could say, say to him. When Jesus helped the, person, the woman who snuck up to him and quiet and just touched him, and he stopped everything and loved her, that was the most loving thing he could do. It's way different. It's different in every scenario. What's love for this person? What do they need? And what's the purpose of it? What's the purpose of this good meeting you have today or this bad meeting? Glorify to glorify them. And you'll do it fine if you serve their needs. It's not 14 verses. It might be. You might do it so well they go, I really trust him. I'm going to tell him my dream. <laughs> but then I got to glorify him, okay? Look, here's the method right here. This is a method. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Yeah, I really recommend you go to church on Sunday. It's a centering point of your life. It's good for you. And yet every moment of your life is worship. Every single moment is a chance to put what you've been given toward the, the worship of God. It's worship when you, when, you, when you just take those three insults and give them back a piece of love. When you forgive them. It's worship. When you use this unbelievable gift. Yes, the soccer player that kicks, kicks it as well as he can and practices all the time. And it's a gift. It's worship back. Yeah. Especially if he knows it or she knows it. Everyone's all worship. Every minute of this day is a chance to worship God. I started by, by praying, said, Lord, give me this day. Help me to be yours. Help me to be faithful. And then in that moment, the, it's an action. It's worship. All day worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Don't believe the lies. The world's saying it's about something else. Over and over and over again. It's a pattern. It's a pattern. We, we've, it's a formation machine, John Tyson likes to say. The world is a formation machine. Don't believe it. You don't have to have that because everybody else does. Don't believe it, but instead, renew it with God's Word. Renew it with these texts. Renew it, what you've learned. Throw away everything I've said that's not consistent with it. And trust Him. Know you're His. And then you can test what love is. I don't know. You could test love and not go well. Joseph was testing love when he didn't comply with what was asked. And he probably thought, that was a bad idea for a couple of minutes. And then he saw what God did with it later. So sometimes tested later. But most of the things you get to test, you know if that was love for that person at the end of it. You go, oh, I kind of messed that one up. I tried to love him, but I didn't, I didn't love him right. I didn't know how. I'm, I need to work on that competency. And that's what we're going to talk a lot about in the fall. How to get more competent at specific things at deploying your gift. But I, so that wasn't, it was still love because I tried. But it wasn't well, I've learned how to love somebody differently in this deal.
I've never been that scenario before. Now I've learned how to love them. So I can test it. God's will and your purpose toward it. We don't test God, but we test the ability to follow his will. We test what love is, and he shows us. He's that good. Lord, you're so good. You're perfect. Every minute of today, yours, and you've got us. You're saying we're yours. Help us to believe it. Help us to know in the, minute, in the middle of it today and tomorrow, as we make big plans, that we're yours and you've got us. That we're, you're our shepherd and we lack nothing. And then help us to move into it that somebody else might know you by us just doing the practical thing they need. And then in that love, that they might come to know you through it by more and more. We pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen.